Welcome everybody to this Digital Thinking with Tortoise. I'm very pleased to be hosting this one despite it not being in the newsroom um, because it's, it's a subject that has been very, very significant to me over the past few weeks um, and links very closely to something that we've been interesting, interested in at Tortoise for a long time, which is the question of whether the UK's drug policy really works. Um, and we're going to be talking today in particular about nitrous oxide, but also um, I think trying to frame it around the, the emergence of these, which are mega canisters of nitrous oxide. And um, I live fairly close to where Notting Hill Carnival takes place. Um, and there were no shortage of these out in the streets to pick up over the bank holiday weekend. It, it is empty um, and safe. Um, but they've really changed the landscape of risk when it comes to using nitrous oxide. Previously, um, people were, were consuming it from individual charges, small canisters that um, were often sold. Oh, well, Steve is holding one of them up. Individual charges that were often sold um, as charges for uh, whipped pressurizing a canister to make whipped cream. Um, but the, the, the central question here for me, I think, is how do we understand the role of nitrous oxide in society in the context of our policy of, for drugs in general? Um, does the legislation that we currently have um, really reflect the harm that drugs do? Um, or does it reflect another blend of agendas uh, or political intentions? So nitrous oxide has really surged into uh, the headlines recently, not least because of the mega canisters and Notting Hill Carnival, but also um, I think because of reports of um, fatalities, nerve damage, brain damage as a result of high frequency use. So that's a big part of the subject um, that we're gonna try and tackle today as we ask the question, you know, what's the truth about nitrous oxide? Are we looking at a ballooning panic that is sort of unjustified, or are we looking at a, a looming public health and, and, and drugs crisis? Um, I'm very lucky to be joined by um, Plinio Ferreira, who is a PhD and research associate um, at Imperial College, London. Hi, Plinio, um, who, who's, who's done work on the harms, uh, med medical conditions associated with, with uh, nitrous oxide use and, and the use of other drugs. Um, and also by Steve Rolles, who is a senior policy analyst um, at Transform Drug Policy Foundation, which of course looks at the role of drug policy in the United Kingdom. Um, the, the main thing I should say though, is that I'd really love to hear from the people joining the call today, uh, not least because I think everybody uh, has either heard or seen a um, a nitrous oxide canister being discharged. There are times where you know you make your way around London and you can't move for uh, uh, canisters littering uh, the the streets. Um, if anybody's been to you know a, a music festival, uh, one of the last things to be cleaned up from sites like Glastonbury and others is, is the, the huge volume of nitrous oxide canisters that make their way onto the site. So please do yeah, raise your raise your digital hand or write in the chat where, where my colleague Seb will be looking out for your, your uh, comments. Um, but I'd love to I'd love to start with Steve, just because we, we were chatting before this about um, about the mega canisters um, and also about the legal status of nitrous oxide. And I, I thought it would be helpful to start at the top with, you know, a framing of what is the legal context for the use of nitrous oxide and, and its sale. If you could tell us a bit about that, that would be really helpful. And then we can we can go from there. Hi, thanks, Luke. Yeah, I mean, nitrous oxide, it's its an unusual drug uh, in that it's the only drug really that we use, which is a gas. Uh, it's not its not a, a pill or a powder or a, a liquid. Um, it's a gas that you inhale. Um, it goes through your, through your lungs into your blood and then has an effect on your brain. Its mode of action is kind of somewhat mysterious, but it has this very sort of pleasurable, euphoric uh, effect. And then as you breathe, it then leaves your leaves your 
bloodstream in the same way carbon dioxide or, or oxygen exchange through your lungs. And it's gone. So it's very short lived. It only lasts about 30 seconds or a minute. Um, people, people like it. It's pleasurable. Um, that's why it's popular. Presumably most drugs, people use them because they, they like them and they enjoy the effects. Um, but it's been around for about 200 years. It was invented by Humphrey Davy, who's famous for inventing the, the, the uh, miners lamp, I think, and, and various other things back in sort of 1793 or something. So it's been around for over 200 years and it's been used as an anesthetic um, for a long time. It's been mixed, uh, mixed with oxygen. It's still used as an anesthetic in dentistry and in childbirth um, and mixed with oxygen um, in that context, it, it's very safe. Uh, but used recreationally, it's not used with oxygen or rarely used with oxygen. It's, it's almost all, always used in its pure form, just inhaled neat, as it were. Um, its legal status is uh, it's quite confusing. I mean, nominally, it is covered by the Psychoactive Substances Act of 2016. Um, this was uh, an attempt to by the government to deal with the sort of problem of so-called legal highs, so drugs that weren't covered by the Misuse of Drugs Act. Um, the, the, the government authorities were struggling to keep up with all these new drugs coming out, because each, and each time they, the, the ACMD would review them, and then they would get banned and, and under the Misuse of Drugs Act, but by that time someone had just changed the molecule slightly, right. and uh, a new one. So they brought in this psychoactive substance out, which basically banned every drug that was psychoactive by default forevermore, that wasn't already covered by the Misuse of Drugs Act. Um, and uh, and also that wasn't alcohol, caffeine, or or, or right. medicine. Yeah. Um, and so, and uh, nitrous oxide was caught in that psychoactive substances dragnet, and it's a rather confusing legal system anyway, because you, we now have two sets of ways to prohibit drugs. One is the Misuse of Drugs Act, and one is the, uh, the the psychoactive substances Act. And the different, the key difference is that possession of drugs under the psychoactive substances Act is not criminalised. Whereas if you're, if you're holding cannabis, ecstasy, whatever, drugs covered by the Misuse of Drugs Act, that is a crime. It's a serious crime. It's an imprisonable crime. To, to Simply to possess a, an amount of those simply drugs. Simply to possess. But yeah. pos so I have here a, uh, a nitrous oxide canister, which is covered by the uh, Misuse of Drugs Act, and I'm not committing a crime because it's not. I'm, I'm possessing it. It's covered by the Psychoactive Substances Act. And it's more confusing that with nitrous because it has a whole load of legitimate uses. Right. So if I bought this legitimately to make whipped cream because I really like whipped cream, um, I, I, that would be fine. If I was a caterer, Wimbledon, Wimbledon's got loads of this nitrous oxide knocking about because everyone has strawberries and cream. Um, so, and it's also used for cars, for, for you know, the, in Fast and the Furious, the nitro turbo button. That's, mm. that's a big canister of nitrous oxide that goes in. I don't know how it works. So it makes your car go faster. If that those films are be, to be believed, which they're probably not, but um, and it's, it has medical uses as, as well. So it has it, and, and it, so it has a range of legitimate medical and industrial uses. Yeah. And so you're allowed to have it for those. And it's very difficult for the police to know what the difference is because if you're if you're caught in possession, a it's not illegal, and b you can go, well, I'm making some whipped cream. Yeah. So so that was precisely what I wanted to ask next, which is what sort of um, what complications or controversy, I guess, does the legal status cause? Because it's good to know that I'm I'm in the clear, even if this were full. But um, there is obviously policing of the distribution of- Right, so, so, so supply, supply of drugs under the, under the Psychiatric Substances Act is prohibited and is an offence and is, you can get arrested, arrested and prosecuted for it. Um, so if you're selling nitrous balloons or if you're distributing nitrous balloons, that is potentially an offence, and you could get uh, in trouble. So people right. do need to do need to be aware of that. In terms of actual levels of enforcement, it's pretty modest. People, very few people, are actually arrested for it unless they are supplying. You know, they're clearly supplying for financial gain. Yeah, particularly if they're doing it to sort of vulnerable populations of kids or whatever. But generally speaking, enforcement against nitrous oxide is pretty minimal. Um, if you look at the number of arrests and prosecutions, that they're, they're, they're vanishingly few compared yeah. to something like cannabis or or cocaine. And but nitrous oxide, in terms of annual prevalence, it's it's quite. It's I think it's the second or third most used um, illegal drug amongst young people. I mean, it's sort of mm. quasi illegal drug, and it, it is illegal. But as I explained, it's it's slightly blurry about what the boundaries of that are. 
Yeah. So, so, but, so but there's the hardly thing... hardly anyone is getting arrested for it. Some people are getting arrested for selling it, but you won't get arrested for possessing it. Okay. Yeah, because because the, the figure I had in front of me was that um, about half a million young people in the UK reported having used nitrous oxide um, in 2019, 2020. I'm not sure if there are more recent figures than that there is but, it's gone it's gone down a bit it went down a bit over the um uh, over the pandemic not surprisingly because the it's a drug that's often used in social situations and obviously there weren't any for large parts yeah. of the pandemic yeah. um but so so use actually has gone down since that peak of 2019 we don't have data for this year yet but my guess is now now social scenes are back on and parties are back on use will rise back up to 2019 yeah. levels that would be my guess right. I, I think I, I would love to sort of circle back to the Psychoactive Substances Act and the legal uh, context for nitrous oxide later on. Um, so it feels like like an important part of this, but um, also very important, I think, to just gloss and, and, and talk about the medical sort of harms related side of this. And I'd love to bring um, Plinio in um, on, on that part of it. The, the simple question player would be how dangerous is is nos well um it's very safe from from the perspective of uh the danger that in a session for example so let's say you having uh, a session of nitrous oxide compared to a session of heroin for example so if we look into these two extremes, uh, nitrous oxide is an extremely safe drug. And also the consumption of it into um, situations that can be frequent or not uh, are considered safe. What is not considered safe, of course, is the repetitive use and the frequent and repetitive views in, in large scale, which is yeah. something that is appearing here and there. And one uh, theory of it is because of the now these big canisters, which make everything more simple. Right. So, so in terms of the pharmacology of the, of, of the molecule is, an, is a very safe uh, entity, let's say like this. Yeah. So, so that does kind of um, beg the question of how far our approach to a given drug from a, a leg legislative, legal, medical point of view, how we approach or how we see a given drug, can it really reflect the fact that depending on how you use the drug, it can be more or less dangerous? As an, a, another way of asking, you, do you think we're overestimating or underestimating the danger from nitrous oxide at the moment? Um, I mean, when you mean when you see when you when you when you say at the moment, what what do you yeah, mean? So by by um by criminalizing its distribution, but okay, not, yes. not possession and use, and also from a medical point of view, you know, are people sufficiently aware of the potential danger? Have they been educated enough to understand that it's as you've just described? You know, like it can be safe, but it can also yeah. not. Yeah, it's it's like any other drug. Um, it it requires education. For example, I think one one example that we can do a parallel with nitrous oxide. It's coffee, for example. Most people have two coffees a day, three coffees a day, and and I'm educated that if you have forty coffees a day you might make a hole in your stomach due to an ulcer. So that's the kind of education it lacks with, with the other drugs, not only nitrous oxide, but also with alcohol, with cocaine, with cannabis, with everything. So if we focus on, on the education of, of young people from the beginning, yeah. in my view, we would have a society with less harms and the, the countries that are actually investing in these initiatives are seeing uh, less percentage 
of death and of, of harm related to, to uh, drugs such as uh, Portugal and, and the Netherlands being two yeah. important uh, countries. So I, I should have asked probably when you first mentioned, but um, how repetitive or intense does the use have to be of, of nitrous oxide before the sort of risk um, starts well, to, to escalate? Yeah. Well, all this is not uh, very well delineated. We, we, let's say we don't have a, a dose uh, dependable curve for nitrous oxide yet to, to know uh, how much NOS you have to do uh, until you start having, having the, the symptoms due to the B12 deficiency. What we know is that people are reporting uh, sessions uh, of um, sessions or, or frequency of use of uh, up to 100 canisters a day during uh, months or, or even uh, two or three years. And we hear these uh, frequency from people who presented with symptoms. Yeah. So um, I'm not saying that uh, you need to do 100 a day for, for six months to have something. What I'm saying is that people that present with symptoms usually have an extremely high frequency compared to the occasional user that yeah. did a bit in Notting Hill or in a house party and then even forgets about it and goes on about their life. A hundred yeah, canister, canisters per day for several months is, yeah, it's a lot. That's a huge amount. I think, I mean, I think the, the important thing to, to think about with this, Luke, is that, that um, you know, any drug, you've got a spectrum of behaviours that's associated with a spectrum of, of, of risks. And, that, you know, at, at one end of this spectrum with nitrous, where people are doing, a few, you know, a handful of balloons at a party once in a while, the risk seems to be negligible. It, it's relative, yeah. it's in, in, in relative terms, a very safe drug. If people are doing tens or hundreds on a more regular basis, you know, 50, 100, and, it's, and it is very, very easy. It's very short acting. You know, you can be sat around for a few hours and you could easily smash through 50 balloons. Now, if you're doing that on a regular basis, you are moving fairly rapidly into a, 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 a position where you could be putting yourself at serious risk of nerve damage right. from B12. Display. But there isn't a fine cut, there isn't a cutoff there's a spectrum of risk and the more you do, the more risk you face. Yeah. So and exactly. but I think what a, a genuine problem is that because of the very low risk of doing a few balloons at a party, it doesn't, it's not really a, so it's not like doing ecstasy where, you know, you have a pill and some people will just take a pill and have died, for example, it's just very unlucky or very unfortunate. Um, you know, you t take a, a nitrous balloon, you're, you're basically going to be fine. But um, the problem is that once people get to establish, oh, well, this is a safe drug, then that people go, well, if it's a safe drug, I can do as much as I like, and that's gonna be, and that's not the case. So I think that the education has to be a bit more nuanced and a bit more sophisticated and say, use in moderation, this is a very safe drug, use mm. in excess, it can be very dangerous. And you need to, you need to educate yeah. people on that distinction. Yeah. Um, well, can I just add one yes, thing? Yes, please, please, yeah. Um, one thing uh, related to, to risks uh, with NOS, which I think is important when we compare to other drugs, is that because we get NOS from, uh, from companies who sell uh, nitrous oxide, and these are not nitrous oxide which are used for other uh, uses. So you are 100% sure that what's inside is nitrous oxide. Therefore, the risks related to the intake of that substance are entirely related to nitrous oxide and only nitrous oxide. Whereas when you have a pill, you don't have much idea what's in it. Yeah. It has a higher chance of being MDMA or amphetamine or whatever you, you're after. But then the risks of having something undesirable and then having a... a, a, a uh, an adverse effect because of that are obviously uh, much, much bigger. So, yeah, because until now it's a regulated market, the risks uh, are uh, less compared to the drugs in an uh, unregulated market. Yeah. Okay. So there, there are a few really good um, sort of questions and observations in the chat. And the first one um, 
I think it would be worth just commenting on, not least, Steve, because, oh, oh, in fact, both of you have just talked about the sort of uncertainty in taking other drugs that are potentially less pure. Um, Lucy was asking, is the risk of intaking or using NOS increased if it's in combination with other drugs that are commonly taken at parties? Um, Steve, do you do you know anything about that? Yes, yes. I mean, I, I mean, obviously, polydrug use uh, will always in, in, increase risks, but n there's no particular uh, risks associated with. There's no kind of particularly violent contraindications of NARS with with other drugs. However, you know, if you if you have a vulnerability or you are particularly um, in in a potentially risky situation then nos is obviously not going to you know taking another drug on top of that is not going to help you are going to increase your, increase your risks but there are certain things like if you're using opioids and alcohol together or benzodiazepines and alcohol or right you know that where where there are particular risks where, of overdose and death but uh, nos no not particularly it's it's a red in terms of i mean i'm not recommending it but it's not a particularly dangerous drug and actually people generally do use it when they're smoking cannabis or if they're on magic mushrooms or if they're on ecstasy and it can kind of potentiate the effects of those drugs and people report that that's an enjoyable thing it's one of the reasons they take it right. um generally speaking it, it doesn't impact on the risks of those drugs particularly but if you have a so, say a heart vulnerability or something it could increase the 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 risks of an adverse yeah. uh, incident. Would you say yeah. that was fair, Plinio? Yeah, no, I uh, I agree completely. Um, poly drug use obviously increase uh, risks, but there is no known pharmacological interaction between NOS and other substances, as we is as is already very well known. For example, as Steve noted. Um, yeah. Noted that, uh, for example, benzodiazepines and alcohol are a uh, receptor well known pharmacological interaction that makes you more prone to have a uh, dep uh, depressive uh, respiratory disorder. So, with NOS, this is not known. Obviously, uh, yeah, as he said, the polydrug is, is just a, a risk factor in general. But, what, but, Luke, I think there's a couple of, I mean, a couple of other risks that we haven't mentioned that are worth, that are worth clocking. Yeah. One is if you hold the balloon in for too long, some people sort of breathe in and out from the balloon and then they, they'll, carbon dioxide will build up in their blood and you can faint. Yeah. So falling and fainting and hitting your head or if you're doing it by a river or you're doing it by a fire, mm. you know, there are risks of fainting and injuring yourself. Um, the obvious thing to do is to make sure you do it when you're sitting down or on a sofa or something. So you use a, a chair or the floor as a bit of sophisticated harm reduction technology in that situation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's also risks of um, using it directly from the canisters or not not using it via a balloon or using it directly from the rip cream squirter because it comes out very, very cold because the pressure decompression and people can get you can really damage like cold burns in your throat and mouth and lips. And that occasionally does happen as well. Yeah. And the other the other way people some you know, some of the deaths that are associated with the nitrous oxide is where people have a big cylinder of it and they'll use it with a mask. Um, like a surgical mask and they'll, they'll be taking like that and they will pass out with the mask on and then asphyxiated and die. Uh, and occasionally people have a bag yeah. over their head with, a, bag, yes. with, a, tube, yes. with a tube. And the, these are misadventure deaths really rather than nitrous deaths. Yeah. You're basically asphyxiating yourself just like if you, well, breathe any, breathe any gas without oxygen in for too long, you will die. Yeah. But that's not so nitrous per se, that's just asphyxiation. Yeah, well, well, this is a perfect, perfect juncture, actually, at which I can say, you know, Tortoise and myself, we no way endorsing uh, or recommending the use of, use of any of the substances, drugs approaches mentioned, of course, in this thinking, it, it is really to help us understand what the implications are, what the, the legal context is. But I, I would also say um, my colleague Seb will um, post in the chat uh, some recognised UK uh, drugs information centers at which you'll be able to find good information about using a variety of drugs. And Steve, uh, Plinio, that's also a question maybe I could put to you uh, later on in this conversation. You know, where do you think people should be 
learning about drugs in the UK? What are the good kind of sources of information to help people understand what's happening at, at, at the moment and in the future? But um, there, there was something that was raised uh, for me, and I just wrote down as you were talking about the potential impurities of um, pills and, and other drugs that, that uh, people sometimes take. Is there an issue with the sort of mislabeling of gas canisters as NOS when they're in fact something else that can be harmful? Is that something that you've either you, Steve, or, or Plinio have, have heard about? Plinio, do you want to well, say um, Particularly, I haven't read uh, anything that uh, people were using other drugs. There, there might be an anecdotal report but as I said, because this is a, until now, this is a regulated market. Yeah. So there are companies which are concerned to sell nitrous oxide because this is, this has a, a use in the food industry mainly. So they are concerning to selling something pure because people will ultimately uh, eat a product made of it. But, you know, uh, that's, that's the source of the, main of the, the that's the main source of nitrous oxide consumption now in the uk and and elsewhere but if there is some other people you know collecting gas in outside hospitals and thinking yeah. that this is nitrous oxide but it could be something else yeah, but it's yeah it's probably it's, it's, it's steep, probably but yeah. it would be helium or oxygen and you, you would you would know pretty quickly that it wasn't the right thing i mean there, there you know the, the problem one of the problems with the fast gas stuff and the the, the the mega canisters that you were doing and some of the stuff that's used for cars is that it's it's not it's not design it's not medical grade for inhalation right um, and there have been concerns that there, there may be some kind of impurities or sulfites or sulfides or some yeah. other things in there which could be uh, a, a risk, but it seems to be at the moment a marginal problem. If we banned, if we do ban uh, nitrous oxide possession, which which Pretty Patel has been threatening with, for our former Home Secretary Pretty Patel has somewhat threatened to do. And just just to contextualise this, she has referred nitrous oxide for a report from the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs, which is the government's expert group who recommends on uh, drug classification and, and criminalisation. Um, for a report, they haven't reported back yet, and it's unclear right. what they'll say. And the government could decide to ban it anyway, because they usually just ignore the ACMD when they don't like what they say anyway. Um, so, so it could we... be it could be that possession would be then covered under the it would move under the Misuse okay. of Drugs Act, and it would be illegal to be in possession. How that would be enforced, it's quite difficult to say. It's quite confusing because, as I say, there there are legitimate reasons why I might have this whipped cream. I might just be having some whipped cream. Um, and you know, so it's going to be quite difficult and tricky to enforce, and that may be a reason why they won't do it. But um, if 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 it is made illegal, you might start getting illegal canister production that was of a lower, yeah. that we're not regulated, and could. I'm not saying it would have other drugs in it, but it might have, um, you know, pollutants or be poorly made and have, you know, industrial byproducts and, and, and other things in it that would not be good for you. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, th I think it's important to to also talk about how nitrous oxide is produced, because it's a, it's a greenhouse gas and it's and it's produced from uh, ammonium nitrate, which is a very uh, explosive um, salt. So you can think about you know if people eventually start to make this uh, on an underground basis what ideas could could come out of it i don't i don't actually know i know that this has to be very tight controlled hmm. but as soon as something gets uh banned and illegal then as steve said the the underground production begins yeah so that's actually a brilliant kind of uh segue into what i hoped would be a, a part of this conversation um because not all that long ago a handful of months um here at Tortoise, we we had a thinking about legalization of drugs in general um, and the approach that's been taken in this country, but also, you know, in the United States and in Portugal and a hand, handful of other countries, which for a long time essentially waged uh, a war on drugs, adopting militaristic 
policing techniques um, in order to try and shut down gangs that were um, distributing drugs. And we, we were joined by um, a former police officer, a former undercover police officer in the UK, um, who after 13 years of working in London and Leeds and all, all over the country, undercover in, in criminal drug dealing gangs, his main observation was that criminalizing drugs uh, exacerbates the problem of illicit drug use, the crime, the um, effects on public health, um, and it also finances uh, the, the, the further expansion of other forms of crime, whether it's burg burglary or human trafficking, uh, carjacking. Um, and it's the reason for which criminal gangs l seek to be more heavily armed to carry knives and, and firearms and things in this country. So I, I wondered if I could ask, potentially ask you, Steve, um, just starting out with the Psychoactive Substances Act and the, the approach that it is forcing us to take to nitrous oxide. What is your, your view on that idea that the policing of illicit drugs and the, the criminalization of both possession and use actually contributes to the problems that we're seeing rather than making them better and does that does that problem or that does that um uh does that paradox almost or that trap apply to nitrous oxide do you think um well i think you made the case very well luke and uh I, you know i don't i don't have that much more to add to it yes clearly prohibition um as a as a policy given that given that its policy goals are to deter people from using drugs and to prevent the availability of drugs and given that we spend billions on it every year trying to do that and every single year from the last half century or more um, we've got further and further away from that goal more and more people are using drugs they're cheaper they're more available they're purer than they've ever been before um, yet we criminalize millions of people and we cause devastation associated with elite, violent illegal markets um, across the world, you know, it's not just in the UK. We're, the cocaine and heroin we use is causing disruption and instability and, and violence in Colombia and Afghanistan and everywhere in between. So the war on drugs has been an utter failure, indisputably on every metric you could possibly imagine, environmental, human rights, criminal justice, public health, total disaster. That is really beyond question. Mm -hmm. um the answer is well what do we do about it and, yeah and, and and my view is that we need to move to a pragmatic public health response that acknowledges the reality of drug use and you manage it to reduce the harms it causes both to people who use the drugs and to wider society um and, and you know transform my organization we've written about how we think we should do that you just need to stop criminalizing people um, who use drugs and we need to have regulated markets for drugs that are used so that people can make informed choices and speak to licensed vendors and avoid the dangers of the illegal market and yeah. that goes for all drugs it's not just lower risk drugs like cannabis or nitrous oxide or it goes all the way up to heroin and cocaine and, and, and mdma and, and so on um, with nitrous um, i mean the, the, i think one of the problems with nitrous at the moment is that when when you buy it um, you don't have any information on, on safer use with it and i think one of the one of the things you could relatively easily do is to mandate that all nitrous oxide being sold for whipped cream use or fast gas or whatever it is that the the um smart whip the big mega canisters it would have mandated health information on the packaging in the same way you get with smoking with packets of cigarettes so it would say yeah. you know do not use this in xyz make sure you always sit down and do it from a balloon and don't do more than five in a session or, or whatever harm reduction information was deemed appropriate by public health people um you know be careful don't overuse use moderately all those kind of sensible public health messages should be available at the point of sale they should be available on all online sales platforms and it should be on the packaging itself on every single cylinder should have health warnings unlike like every packet of cigarettes does yeah it seems like an obvious and easy thing to do that would that would obviously get those important harm reduction messages to the right people i.e people who are sucking back the balloons at parties and so yeah. on well um, it feels it feels like a bit of a stretch to imagine that we would do that when we we haven't done it for example with alcohol and there was a, an enormous uphill battle to do it with 
tobacco products. Right, but we obviously we... should do it. We, there, there are big campaigns by the, the Royal Society for Public Health and the Royal Colleges of Medicine. Um, it's advocated by the World Health Organization. And, and you know, all competent m- medical authorities think that we should have mandated health warnings on alcohol. And the fact that we don't is an outrageous, you know, you don't even have to put ingredients on alcohol like you do on yeah. every other beverage and food in the country, even though you don't have to have, any, there's, more, there's more health warnings on a packet of aspirin you buy in Poundland than there is on a bottle of whiskey um, that you buy in, you know, Aldi next door. It's, 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 that's absurd. And that's not a reason not to do it for other drugs. It's a reason that we should do it for alcohol as well. I mean, I, I, you know, people should be able to use drugs, but they should be able to make informed choices about the risks when they do. And you can't do that if you don't have access to information. And the, the way to guarantee access to information is through responsible uh, legislation and accountability of, of vendors and product labeling and, 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 and so on. We know how yeah. to do it. We just choose not to. So we're I, just I'd, stupid and irresponsible. Well, I'd, lo- I'd actually like to ask you just a bit further before I turn to Plinio um, with a question about the role that research can play. But just just to dwell on that a bit more, it does seem like quite a serious um, situation we've got ourselves into where we, we have drugs policies that are nominally for uh, the benefit of people in society, but they seem to function to do almost the opposite. They seem to function almost to harm people in society. Um, what what buttons is Transform trying to press to change the situation that you've just described, Steve? What Who do you try and speak to? Is there an avenue in government? Is there an avenue through think tanks? And then Plinio, I'd love to turn to you to, to talk about the role that research, you know, peer reviewed research can play. Well, I mean, Transform, we, we do a range of advocacy um, with, with, with policymakers, with media, with a range of professional bodies and, and professional groups. We produce proposals, we, pres- we, we gather and uh, present analysis and evidence, um, and we make the case, like, I guess, like any uh, charitable advocacy group or think tank. And, and we work with other org- organisations like Drug Science and Release and the Beckley Foundation and internationally with, with similar organisations across the world to try and advocate for better drug laws. Uh, You know, we know how to do these things. We need to move away from the kind of ideological war on drugs prohibitionist mindset, which has so spectacularly failed for for the last half century, and reorient to evidence-based public health thinking, which acknowledges the reality of drugs in society and seeks to manage manage that use in ways that, uh, you know, reduce social and health harms associated with drugs for users and for wider society, rather than making those problems worse, which is unfortunately, however well-intentioned it may have been once upon a time, unfortunately, the war on drugs makes all of the problems worse. It doesn't stop people using drugs. It just makes the drugs more dangerous and empowers global networks of, of, of um, organised organized crime groups who sell the drugs and profit from them. It's just, it's just a total disaster, the war on drugs, yeah. I and mean, we need to move away from it as fast as possible. And the work that Transform and others do has mapped out how we do that, and then we advocate on the basis of that, that analysis to the relevant policymakers, media, public audiences to try and affect change. And, and we are getting there. You know, cannabis is being legalized in countries across the world. There's serious debates in the Senate in Colombia about legalizing coca leaf and cocaine. There's psychedelics are being legalized in some US states. Um, these debates are beginning to happen. There's a serious debate going on in the Netherlands about legalizing and regulating uh, MDMA, yeah. for example. Um, so these debates are, are happening and in many cases in real world changes actually happening. Um, but in some places, things are going backwards. You know, and if we decide to criminalise possession of nitrous oxide, that would be a big step backwards. You know, the, yeah. the, the, what we have at the moment is, is, is suboptimal because we haven't, uh, we don't, it's neither really, it's neither banned nor legally regulated. It's in this kind of generally unsatisfactory legal grey gray area where, you know, Pete, you can buy it, but it's used for whipped cream and it doesn't have any information on safety on it, mm-hmm. which is ridiculous. Um, but but you can't sell it and you can't get information on it. And it's, it's all just a mess. So we do yeah. need to regulate these legal drugs properly. Um, but, we, you know, banning them is certainly not the right way to go. Yeah. So, um, Plinio, I, I'm, I'm looking at the, the front page of a, of a paper in drug science that you, yourself and Steve and, and David Nutt, who um, was one of the people that I sort of came to this harms based and evidence based drugs policy topic through. Um, 
that was looking at you know the the harms from nitrous oxide i i'm i'm aware that you've done a, a range of work and that a range of work has been done on the harm to the user and harm to society from a range of different drugs and when i uh hear steve talk about the psychoactive substances act um and the exemptions for for, for caffeine for um nicotine and for alcohol uh, alcohol appears very close to the top of um a number of lists that try to appraise harm to the individual and harm to society, and yet it's legal. Um, and now we're having a discussion about criminalizing nitrous oxide further, despite everything we've just heard about its general safety with infrequent and moderate use. Um, my question to you is, what role can research play in helping to shape that, uh, that distinction and, and, and pushing the conversation in the right way? Well, my, my, my view is that um, research with the criminalized and banned drugs are important for, I don't know, may, mainly two, two aspects. One of them, obviously, is the safety of the user, uh, as, we, as we told, uh, and make uh, everything very clear. What are the risks when you take it? And how should you take it and and what frequency so that's that comes to research which is tightly uh bind to to education so we can't we can't have a system in my view where the consumption of drugs will be done in a safe way uh until we as a society think of more sustainable ways of consuming it because the way that right now drugs are consumed is completely unsustainable to 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 the system in a way mm. because it will that um, if it, it directly affects not only the society where the drugs are consumed but also the product for the, the societies where it's produced and the societies which transport it. So education goes in this way and research has to be the basis to provide the people who are educating with uh, secure and, and right information. Yeah. So this is one aspect. The other aspect, as I see, is the therapeutical uh, benefits of, these, of the drugs, for example. The revolution with psilocybin and LSD that we're seeing now, this is not new. Uh, you know, in, if you see other cultures where uh, the consumption of, of psilocybin, for example, has been done for, for thousands of years, they, these drugs, are, these, these mushrooms are seen, are, are seen in medicine, and they are used in a way that uh, it's, uh, it's seen as a medicine. Right, so, and also in the 60s, in the 40s, 50s, there was uh, research with psilocybin and in the 60s, in the 70s with LSD in order to, to see if these drugs had actually any therapeutic potential. And at the time they concluded they had so many uh, psychiatrists and uh, psychologists in the US and the UK were pioneering research on, on psilocybin on LSD. Uh, for depression, for PTSD, for all sorts of uh, scenarios that they seem fit at the time. So to me, also research uh, fits in this, uh, in this situation. Also, yeah. research is very important for the social aspects of it, which has more to do what Steve does and also understanding the, the impact of drugs in society into a more uh, anthropological and sociological way. Yeah, so yeah. it's so interesting. So th there was a part in that first uh, point you were describing about the sustainability of the drug industry, I suppose, globally. Yeah. What, did, did you mean that both the supply side of that economy, the way drugs are produced and move around the, the globe, and also the demand, the actual end user, the number of end users and, and the drugs that they use, both sides of that you see as unsustainable. We're consuming drugs at an unsustainable rate and we're also producing them 
at an unsustainable yeah. rate? Or do you believe that the total size and demand for, for drugs in the market is sustainable from a public health point of view? It's just the way that we uh, satisfy yeah. that demand. Yeah, I think not only me, but uh, if you look into this, uh, the speech for the new president of Colombia that he's done on, on the NATO recently, last week or something, he was talking about consumption because consumption, which is demand, drives the production. Yeah. Therefore, uh, the, the rich states where these drugs are mainly sold for, for profit, for, for big profit, are consuming without any sort of, of, of limit. We've seen the increase in cocaine consumption in the UK uh, at going at, at steady rates. Therefore, the demand, the, the demand that this is driving will uh, actually reflect on the production because these states uh, are hostages of, of the demand and right. they will keep producing. So I think therefore education into the forms of consumption have to be the first uh the first measure to me in order if you want to create a more sustainable and 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 legalized or not even or regulated market but yeah. as soon as but first we need to consume this in a safe and in an ethical way which is something that we as a society are not doing at the moment yeah so I, I guess it would be uh, it would be very helpful, in fact, for for me to turn to a, a part of this conversation now, as just as we get towards the end, which is about the role of um, journalism in shaping our attitude to drugs. Um, I don't know about anybody else, and please do chime in. Just raise your hand um, or or uh, put put a comment in the chat if you have a view on this. Um, it feels like most of our opinions and our knowledge of drugs is shaped by one of two things. The first is direct experience that we might not have that much sort of control or framing for, and the other is in the press. And I think in reading the stories after Notting Hill Carnival, um, seeing it reported, you know, that um, three and a half uh, tons of nitrous oxide canister debris had been found just in the little area of London in which Notting Hill Carnival takes place over the weekend. Um, more prominent reporting of the fatalities from the type of intense, intensive nitrous oxide use that we've been talking about comes in. Um, but there isn't as much discussion about, for example, the stuff that you've just been mentioning um, Plinio, you know, what does the research really tell us? How can we move towards a um, a safer and more ethical approach to not only policing or, or controlling, regulating drug use, but also educating about it? Um, and Steve, I guess I could put it to you first, and then anybody else who wants to chime in, please do. Um, how do you think that journalists talk about drugs in a helpful way? <laughs> No, no, not at all. I mean, um, uh, I mean, you, you, I, I don't want to make generalizations. I mean, you know, you're a journalist. This, this discussion is useful. There's a plenty of very good drug journalism as well. But predominantly, we're talking about kind of more tabloid type um, sort of horror stories. I mean, the, 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 with nitrous oxide, just using it as an example, uh, you know, you have these periodic sort of splurges of nitrous oxide related coverage, which and we're in we're kind of in the middle of one at the moment because of the the, the Notting Hill thing and there was a fatality as you, as you mentioned um you know there was a few footballers caught using nitrous oxide a, a, a while back and i think one of the royal family the princes i can't remember which one it was i don't care um were using um caught using nitrous oxide and you get these kind of splurges of panic and the the the, 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 the journalists kind of you know panic sells if it bleeds it leads you know you know imperiled youth these are very seductive um sort of journalistic tropes that get clicks and they sell copy um and you know reporting about drugs where people are responsible and behave 
safely and have a nice time. It's just boring. It's much better if you've got some imperiled youth, particularly if it's sort of teenage, white teenage girls, um, you know, in, in danger. Uh, mm. And this goes back to the whole reefer madness type nonsense from the from the 30s and 40s. Um, you know, what, what do we need? We need proper drugs education that, that, that you know, yes, abstinence messages and ha have their place. But we also need to acknowledge that a significant minor minority of young people do use illegal drugs and a significant majority of people, if you include alcohol and tobacco, um, they, they, they use drugs. So we need to educate people um, about risks and, and, and help them, support them to make informed, responsible choices that will help keep them safe. Um, you, you can't do that in, in the context of ludicrous, hyperbolic, tabloid drug panics. Um, you can do that with effective targeted um, education from public health experts um, based on evidence of, of, of what engages young people and what, you know, you meet them where they're at. If you start saying, you know, just say no messages, for example, classic case of, you know, it look, politically, it looks great. Yeah, we're taking this seriously. We're stopping young people doing drugs. But it's a bit like telling young people to stop having sex or, to, you know, that's just ridiculous. They're going to take drugs. They're going to have sex. We need to help them to, you know, use practice safe sex and, um, you know, take drugs safely if they when they decide to, if they decide to. And this is, you know, or, or eat healthy diet, healthy eating. We don't ban kebabs and McDonald's. We don't ban people from having sex criminalize them for not wearing condoms you encourage them to eat healthily and to practice safe sex and the same same with same with alcohol and same with illegal drugs um, we know how to do this there's an extensive literature there's all there's thousands of public health professionals here and around the world who, who know how to do this it, it's a, the problem is political will the government has to stop trying to exploit the drugs issue stop drawing it into sort of populist law and order nonsense you know unfortunately labor and the conservatives are in a bit of a bidding war at the moment so you can be toughest on law and order with an election looming and drugs gets drawn into that even though it's a health issue shouldn't really be a criminal justice issue at all but it gets sucked into that and it's then who can be the toughest on drugs who can be, which means who's the toughest on drug users which means who's the toughest on young people mm. and it's completely counterproductive because if the authorities are trying to criminalize and arrest you you're not going to listen to them when they say oh well maybe you should only have five balloons at a party and not you know they you 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 alienate your core audience if you're also trying to put them in prison they're not going to listen to health advice from you um so yeah we need to shift to a, you know responsible public health but drugs drugs have been so divorced from the public health sort of scientific norms for so long politicians mm. have forgotten that it's just a it's just a public health issue like everything else sex diet alcohol you know, we know how to deal with these things. We just don't do it for illegal drugs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, listening to you there, particularly in the way you mentioned um, sort of diet, sugar intake and obesity, right. it does make me think, you know, we, we clearly have a, a, a looming crisis on that front um, and a government that at least for now is saying we we shouldn't be telling people what to eat measures like the um the proposed sugar tax in the in the government's food strategy uh, but we do yeah. we do it with drugs we, we, yeah. we it'd be like it'd be like criminalizing skittles it's ridiculous right. but we you know we did you know you, you you would criminalize people for having you know a can of fanta mm. <laughs> we don't do that with anything else but we do do it for drugs certain drugs not even all drugs we do it for certain drugs um, and it just doesn't work. And if you need evidence that it doesn't work, look at the, the fact that we have the highest level of drug deaths ever in history and the highest level of drug deaths in the whole of Europe. You know, a third of all European drug deaths take place in the UK. Um, you know, drug, Scotland has the highest level of drug deaths in, 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 in the Western world. It, the, if, you, if you want evidence of yeah. failure, it is all around us. And yet we just keep on doing the same stupid populist law and order tough on drugs bullshit that all the evidence shows doesn't work ne never worked doesn't never worked anywhere and yet on we go because it you know it presses a few buttons in the mm. daily mail or whatever tabloid a particular politician is trying to pander to it's yeah. it's it's not just ridiculous it's actually negligent and cost lies and it, it, we really do need to change that and as, as soon as possible yeah well it's it's something that i think we 
you know, as a, as a newsroom, we'll have to go away and think about um, not not least because I I can't help but think back to that conversation we had a couple of months ago with with the, with this person who you know had been as close to the issue as you could get, yeah. you know, and un, 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 undercover um, in in these communities in gangs and had formed relationships with people who were direct directly involved dealing and and taking drugs and seen over the course of more than a decade what it did what the policing did to to these uh communities um we need to think as as tortoise you know what where what are the areas in which people deserve better information um and how can we give it to them and who should we be speaking to to, to get it in the first place um Pl Plinio, I, my, my, one of my last questions for you, because I, I guess we're um, we're running slightly short on time, would be um, where where's your research? What's on your research agenda? You know, go, going forward, um, what are you most interested in looking at? And, and I guess you know, from a drug science perspective, what do you think are the most important topics? Well, um, just to make clear, um. I'm a researcher at Imperial College where I do vascular science and I work as a researcher for drug science um, as a voluntary, mm -hmm. where I developed this project with Prof. Nut on nitrous oxide and, and poppers actually. So why I'm in there? Because my PhD was on nitric oxide which is the molecule that is delivered by the poppers. So my PhD was all in, in NO, which is something that uh, I'm an expert on. The thought prof, uh, after I contacted him, he uh, drafted me to, to help on helping on this, on this project because he was being um, called to be um, expert on some, uh, legal cases where right. people were being caught by by uh, by by distributing nitrous oxide and poppers therefore he asked my help in order to to help him uh, clarify this this situation to to the general public so the first thing we've done was this review where we talked about the the pharmacology of of uh, nitrous oxide and poppers and the social aspects of it. And then came the, the MCDA, which was the, the, the yeah. expert review on the two drugs, in addition to the big panel that they've done in 2010. And which, which is on, uh, you can read that paper now, it's online and it's free text. Exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, I'm, I'm in constant, constantly in contact with him, but um, I'm, I'm waiting for him to see what's the next step because I've literally, we've literally just published, yeah. so we kind of closed this, this project for now. Uh, and my research on vascular science, which is something that I do on day to day, are not yeah. uh, much more the, the contest for this interview. But I'm on always uh, up for discussions on this subject, yeah. which is something that I particularly like and, and read about. So, okay. Yeah, well, perhaps I should certainly self will come back. Yeah. I, perhaps I should have said, you know, put put us on the list of people to tell next time there's a there are findings coming out. Um, yeah. Well, Luca, so, one of the things one of the things we're working on is um, looking at legal regulation models for stimulants, including cocaine and uh, you know again it, it, it's not because we think cocaine's a great drug it's because people take it, it the rea we have to deal with the, the world we live in and the reality is lots of people take cocaine and the illegal market for cocaine is is really dangerous it's the yeah. same with any drug however whatever your starting point however risky a drug is it becomes more risky when it's produced and sold through in, in an unregulated illegal market and that goes for nitrous cannabis everything all the way through to cocaine and heroin so you know, we're actually developing legal regulatory models for cocaine and coca leaf products. And we're working with, the, there's, a, there's a bill that we've been working with, with politicians in Colombia in the Senate being debated for a pilot legal cocaine market. And one of the people who worked on that bill is now the president of Colombia. He was elected last month. So, mm. um, you know, these, these are real debates that are happening now in the real world. And it's not just about cannabis. And it's not just about nitrous. It's about some of the more challenging drugs like MDMA and, and, and 
uh, and heroin prescribing and, and cocaine now as well. So yeah. these debates are happening. And if people are interested in that, please go check out the Transom website. And um, if you want to get involved, please do. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Well, it's transform it's left me. drug science and drug science. transform drug science and and uh, what release else? Um, release. Yeah, yeah. There's many many uh, websites where you can get uh, free and and good information on yeah. drugs. Excellent. Well, I I hope that that, that this conversation you know has been useful information it certainly feels like it has been for me um having come to this topic with a real interest but not actually much knowledge so thank you so much Plinio and Steve and and to everyone who's uh commented in the chat we'll we'll certainly be looking uh looking out for you know further peer-reviewed evidence but also at the changes that the the new government makes with regards to the psychoactive substances act other pieces of drug legislation and and with nitrous oxide um yes th thanks so much everybody for joining i really do hope it's been helpful um cheers steve plinio everybody else hope you have a good evening and we'll see you soon mm -hmm.